call the June 23rd, 2016 regular council meeting to order. Would council members please denote your presence by suppressing your yes switch. All council members are present. Okay. Council meetings are also televised and can be viewed on cable channel 192. Please join me in the pledge of would entertain a motion to approve by minute action the minutes of the June 7, 2016 regular council meeting as published in the Casper Star Tribune on June 15, 2016. So moved. Second. Moved by Councilman Hopkins, seconded by Haley. Corrections. Please cast your votes. And please record the vote. With all members voting aye, motion passes. Chair, we have a motion to approve by minute action the June 21st, 2016 bills and claims as audited by City Manager McDonald. So moved. Second. Moved by Councilman Miller. Seconded by Councilman Johnson. Any abstentions? Hold on. Cast your votes. And please record the vote. With all members voting aye, motion passes. Happy City of Council has initiated the Castro Municipal Court Alcohol Program in November of 2012 with the specific purpose of reducing the incidence of impaired driving in the city of Casper and surrounding areas. The court has been effective in adjudicating first and second time DUI offenders by imposing firm, consistent, and effective sentencing with highly structured, effective intervention. The city of Casper has been awarded a leadership award from the governor's council on impaired driving for the success of its alcohol court program. At this time, I would like to present this award to judge of the city alcohol court, Judge Maxwell. Council will now address the main business portion of the meeting. Council carries out its business by three types of action, by ordinance, resolution, and by minute action. Ordinances require three readings and votes, whereas other items are passed by one. 
Excuse ordinances me. create or modify lo local law, whereas resolutions and minute actions provide for council to carry out its business. These various actions have different publication and public hearing requirements. Items may be considered by consent or not consent. Items not listed as consent will be discussed by council and there is a process for the public as well as council to pull an item from consent. Council will now hold previous scheduled public hearings for the purpose of obtaining public input. Public hearings are held for items such as annexations, liquor license transactions, passage of the budget, and zone changes. The city attorney will present applicable exhibits for the issue and the city manager will give a council a report. Members of the audience will then be asked to speak either in favor or against the issue and the council will discuss the issue and act upon it if necessary. Consideration of this item will be by resolution. I now declare the public hearing for the consideration of the fiscal year 2015-2016 budget adjustments. City Attorney Bill Lubin, do you have any exhibits? Uh, I do, Your Honor. We have two exhibits for this item. Correspondence from Cassia Smith to VH McDonald dated June 13th, 2016. And exhibit number two, that being the affidavit of publication as published in the Casper Star Tribune dated June 15th, 2016. I do, Your Honor. <clears throat> the, the Wyoming Municipal Budget Act prohibits the expenditure or encumbrance of any money in excess of the amounts provided in the budget for each department. To comply with this requirement, City Council may authorize um, budget adjustments um, periodically. Casper, in Casper, typically twice a year, we evaluate the budgets to see if we need adjustments. Um, at mid-year, we do that for capital. At year-end, we, we focus more on operations to see if... Uh, uh, we need um, adjustments for unplanned events such as um, conditions we didn't know about, simple budget errors, or um, a, as you'll see later, available funding, particularly grant funding that came available after the adoption of the budget. For fiscal year 2016, the year-end adjustments uh, staff is requesting is $2,584,528. Uh, consisting of a $551,982 increase to the general fund to fund the um, general fund departments and general fund dependent um, funds for the voluntary retirement offer that was made to employees and to increase the municipal band tax distribution due to higher than anticipated property tax received, which is legally obligated to the band. Police grant funds um, increased $164,793 and that is for grant funding that was not awarded until after the beginning of the year. Weed and Pest Fund increased $19,536,000 to restore funding for a salary of the Wyoming Extension Outreach Coordinator that was originally cut from the budget. Municipal Golf Course Fund increased $33,388 to fund retirement incentive and uh, accrued leave payouts for el eligible employees. Casper Ice Arena increased $10,641, again, to fund the voluntary retirement um, offer and accrued leave payouts. Casper Event Center increased $200,951 to provide funding for increased cost of shows that were um, signed and brought on after the year that we, we don't know the extent of which when we start the year, and to provide retirement uh, funding for the retirement setting program and that fund also. The Fleet Maintenance Fund increased $323,713 to buy additional vehicle supplies. Um, we, we don't know what those will be any given year, and, and we, had we had more than we budgeted to cover the cost of a casualty loss that was charged appropriately to the um, maintenance fund, a large piece of equipment that was um, damaged and later paid for with insurance and again to fund retirement incentive payouts for eligible employees. Building and Structures Fund increased $37,067 to fund the voluntary retirement offer and accrued leaves for eligible employees. 
property and liability fund, increased $444,528 for non-personnel expenses incurred for firefighting operations and city property damage loss and cleanup from the um, station fire, the Coal Creek fire, and to fund retirement incentives and accrued leave payouts for eligible employees. Water fund increased $488,929 to fund the retirement incentive for employees and to fund an, un an unplanned uh, um, street reconstruction water line. And last is the water treatment plant fund increased $300,000 to fund ad additional chemicals needed and additional le electricity needed for higher um, water demand and production that was anticipated. Funding for these adjustments comes from $1,387,114 of unanticipated revenue and $1,197,414 of reserves. Thank you. And just in general, we would characterize these budget adjustments by state statute. We have to balance our budget. So when unanticipated things come up, we have to adjust it so that the accounting is correct and we don't go over budget. Is, is that right? Yes, Your Honor. Okay. <clears throat> All right. At this time, I would ask those individuals who wish to speak in favor, favor of the fiscal year 2015-2016 budget adjustments to please approach the lectern. Speaking in favor of the budget adjustments. No one speak in favor? Are you sure? All right. At this time, I would ask those individuals who wish to speak in opposition of the fiscal year 2015-2016 budget adjustments to please approach the lectern. Speaking in opposition to the budget adjustments. Welcome, Mr. Rollins. Then, if the economy improves, then buy the buses. Don't buy the buses now. Um, I also think we may need to make an adjustment of adding pay cuts across the board for city workers. Um, something above anybody who makes, let's say, about $10 an hour, give them a 5% pay cut. I'm sure most the employees working for the city or the county district realize many other people. Really can't halfway through, you can't raise taxes. You need to make a massive 
drastic cost. And that's not good. When you have to six months in, most of you realize you really are incredibly challenging here. And all of a sudden you're laying up here, laying up here, cutting back here, cutting back there. But you really don't want to make those cuts because those are priority issues. You wish you would have never spent something three months ago, like I buying the buses. Don't buy the buses, don't make it another expense that you really don't need. Road improvements, you know, pavement, uh, paying, uh, painting lines on the road for bicycles for three hundred thousand dollars. If that's a priority, fine. But that can wait. Not this year, maybe another year. First of all, no one ever stays there. They never drive in there anyhow. And then the numbers are there, right? I bike all the time. They're driving there all the time. Uh, to be honest, I live in New York City now for this year. This council reminds me of the old illegal black belt liberals of the city council in New York City. They spend, spend, spend like crazy. And that's what you guys do. You're rational know, spending. What's up next? You guys are banned uh, handguns and Rifles of the city limits also? I mean, this is what's up. Both things coming, you guys are they're coming just from New York City Council members. Pick who you are, I'll throw a lot to you. I hope the voters vote all six of you up. One of you is running for the next uh, house in Wyoming. I hope that person does not make it either. They get another big spend there. You really need to take a more pragmatic approach. Don't spend money for the pool last year when revenue was dropping. You're spending money for the Pentagon. Lawn, that was another mistake. Spend, spend, spend. It's going to have a lot of things you're spending money in. Total, irrational approach. We need to make cuts. We may need to make adjustments in this budget right now. And at this part of the hearing, this is where we talk about making further cuts. Do we need to make them, or do we just stop them? But in this case, we'll probably be speaking at the lectures next year because we won't have a council. Duly noted. Questions or comments for Keith Rowland? Anyone else to speak in opposition of the budget for the fiscal year 2015-2016? There being no one else to speak for or against the fiscal year 2015-2016 budget adjustments, I'm going to do it. I now declare public hearing closed. The chair would entertain a motion to, by resolution, authorize fiscal year 2015 2016 budget adjustments. So moved. Second. Moved by Councilman Pacheco. Seconded by Councilman Hopkins. Discussion. Correct me if I'm wrong, Mr. McDonald, but uh, all of the matters that are included in these budget adjustments have already been gone through this council and have been voted on in a public meeting, and we're really just after the fact, uh, after having made these decisions, making the budget balance. Your, Your Honor, these specific adjustments have, have not gone to council yet. This is the first time you see them, oh, okay. but they're part of the whole budget that Excuse me for that, but they, they, uh, they're part of the whole budget that you've seen all year long and the budget reports that you've seen all year long. Councilman Schlager and then Councilman Hopkins. I just wanted to clarify my memory. Our new budget that we are enacting was 36% reduction in cost savings that we shot for. Is that correct? The bottom line budget was reduced 38%, 37% because of a lot of capital project load from 2014-2015. So a lot, a lot of the changes of that of that 38% number um, on the next item will be is driven by the change in capital. Okay, and a, a follow up, Your Honor. Yeah. Um, if I recall correctly, these projects were already earmarked from the past, and really we have to finish and follow through with those? Yes, Your Honor. Oh, thank you. Councilman Hopkins. Yeah, just to be clear, this is this is our second go around in adjusting, making budget adjustments. As VH uh, mentioned, we did one earlier in the year. We eliminated some salary increases early in the year, and this is the second time we have done this, and this is the norm. So this is 
budget adjustments, not next year's budget. Anyone on the council want to address the hair on fire, liberal, spent, crazy characterization that was placed before us? I don't see smoke in the air. Okay. Sure. I'm not going to comment on that. I, I tend to have some a hard time getting, figuring out issues and explaining that out. Sometimes I babble, so I'll try to do my best. Um, I want to say uh, the VH and our city manager and the, and the budget staff um, and the whole staff and people that work for the city did a tremendous job of presenting to us what we needed to do to continue moving the city forward. So they are commended for what they do. Uh, our city manager is the right person for this position to, at this right time to help us through this. And um, we're moving forward in that. And I think the confidence, the utmost confidence should be in the city as far as city manager uh, McDonald has done um, and the prudence and the pragmatism that we have um, tried to work with um, at this level with all of us. Um, the conversations that we had, the open communication that we have um, is better probably at any time in the last four to five years, this council has worked better in that and the utmost confidence. And I stand by that and I stand by the budget office that did the work for us um, and led us through this um, and the leadership of uh, VH um, and the work that he did. So uh, nice job. Thank you. Councilman Miller. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. I suppose I'll just uh, kind of address the same thing as Councilman Pacheco did as well. You know, we, we, we have these meetings to kind of help make these decisions based on data from our city staff. And so the, to mirror kind of what Councilman Pacheco said, you know, they did a lot of work in trying to present these things and figure out pragmatic ways to cut our, to cut our budgets without loss of providing the services that we need to to, um, to the city. So, you know, we, we got the numbers, and if we do end up in one of these uh, financial exigencies, you know, I'm sure we'll be back here. Now, I, uh, Mr. Roland, I do appreciate your, your comments, and, the, you know, these are things that we're always looking at. But we, we sat in through a lot of meetings with our staff and telling us why they're spending the money, where it's going, and what their plans are for cuts in the future. And this is, this is where we're at today, and I'm sure we'll be looking at different things in the future. Thank you. Okay, um, I have a question for City Manager McDonald. Um, this 38, 37% figure that was quoted by Heather Richards at the Casper Star Tribune, um, is this reflective of just mostly capital monies and perhaps just shifting that around as we prioritize? Is that a fair characterization? Your, Your Honor, it's a, it's a comparison of different years with a lot of capital project load. For example, the $24 million of 1% uh, 14 allocation, the way, the way budgeting and governmental accounting works, that turns, into 24, that turns into $48 million of budget because it's accounted for in two funds, the fund collected and then the fund expended. So you, you collect it, you transfer it out of the collection fund, you transfer that into the expending fund, and then you expand it. So there's a lot of a lot of capital load when 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 capital activity goes on. So that that 38 percent decrease reflects the change in that capital activity. A lot of it. Point of order, Your Honor. I, I think we're having a little trouble here making a distinction between the budget adjustment discussion and the fiscal year 17 budget discussion, and uh, I think. Since this is the matter before us, the budget adjustments for the fiscal year that is about to close, we should keep our comments focused on this matter, and we'll have an opportunity to discuss our opinions about the fiscal year 17 budget, and the next item is before us. And Mr. Mr. Rowland, your, your comments were also really related more to the fiscal year 17 budget that we're about to discuss, I think. And so I think we should dispense with the budget adjustment <clears throat> and get on to the, the real serious matter of the set fiscal year 17 budget. I'm not that the budget adjustments aren't serious, but 
I think we're getting right. these things confused. Right, and that's very helpful clarity. Thank you. Any more questions or comments? I got one more. This council is not entertaining any ideas of regulating the size of your soft drinks or who or where gets to carry firearms. That's quite frankly above our purview and I, I see that those are really good examples of regulation out of control so many would consider me a liberal but it ain't true. <laughs> Ain't true. But New York City is a great place to visit. It is. Before. But I don't like anybody telling me how many ounces <laughs> of soda I can drink. Anyway, any more discussion? Any more amendments? Please cast your vote. And please record the vote. With all members voting aye. Motion passes. Consideration of this item will be by resolution. I now declare the public hearing open for the consideration of the adoption of fiscal year 2016-2017 budget. City Attorney, Bill Lubin, do you have any exhibits? I do, Your Honor. I have uh, two exhibits for this item. Exhibit number one being correspondence from Cassia Smith to V.H. McDonald dated June 14th, 2016. <clears throat> And exhibit number two, that being the affidavit of publication as published in the Casper Star Tribune dated June 15th, 2016. City Manager McDonald, your report, please. Your Honor, presented tonight for the City Council's consideration is the adoption of the fiscal year 2017 proposed budget. Um, before I start on the details, I thank uh, department heads for their efforts in, in uh, um, putting together this budget, and Cass Smith, the budget administrator, and Kirk uh, Gunderson, the accountant, for their efforts to prepare a, a budget in a year that was a little bit more than challenging. Yeah. For fiscal year 2017, the city's total revenue budget is $148,350,301, and the total expenditure budget is $155,414, excuse me, $414,251. And both those numbers are inclusive of internal transactions within the city. Could, could we go over those numbers again? The first number was $148,350,301. Revenue budget, expenditure budget, $155,414,251. Thank you. The expenditure budget consists of the general fund, which, which supports general operations, that budget is $45,345,069. Capital project funds, that, those funds account for um, capital directed revenue, including what, optional one cent number 15 currently, and the expenditures of those funds. The budget for those, the total budget for those funds is $19,496,589. The enterprise funds, the enterprise funds consist of two groups of funds, the utility enterprise funds, such as water, sewer, sanitation, bail fill, wastewater, and I think that's all of them. And then the leisure service enterprise funds, um, event center, Hoganon, golf, um, aquatics, and, and uh, I'm probably missing a couple of those. The, the total enterprise fund budget is $59,312,732. Special revenue funds, those are funds are, that have, the revenue is um, um, specified for, for specific purposes. That includes things like the community development grant block, community development black, block grant fund, CDBG, I can get the initials better, the acronym better than the title. Um, the Metropolitan Planning Organization, a lot of those funds that are uh, federally or, or state provided for specific purposes. The, and that, that budget is $6,875,266. Debt service fund, that's a small fund that we use to support um, assessment districts when we create them. It's a capital related fund, very small budget, $1,092. The internal service funds, those are funds that provide services internally to other operations of the city. Those include buildings and structures that supports buildings, 
fleet maintenance that supports our, our rolling stock and, and fleet. Um, IT is an internal service fund. The total of that budget, those budgets are, is $8,414,196. And lastly, the trust and agency funds. Those are funds of, of money we hold in trust for, for specific purposes. And those include the employee health insurance fund, the um, perpetual care fund, and, and the like. The total of the, those funds is $15,969,307. Again, the total expenditures is one million is one hundred fifty five million four hundred fourteen thousand two hundred fifty one dollars. Um, because of the duplication of transfers and expenses, we typically take out the intergovernmental transactions that we charge between funds. That total is twenty six million thirty two thousand five hundred twenty dollars. So the net budget, net, net expenditure budget was one hundred twenty nine million three hundred eighty one thousand seven hundred thirty one dollars. And these amounts include the cost for the voluntary retirement offer um, made to employees that closed after the budget review, and we, and we finalized those numbers last week, and, and these numbers reflect that. Thank you. For fiscal year 2017, $7,063,950 is proposed to be spent from various funds reserves. The components of this amount are general fund, uh, spending $954,997,000 of reserves for operations, capital projects fund, spending $444,428, again, not again, but for capital. The enterprise funds, again, water, sewer, those, those, inter those funds that have a lot of capital expenditures, um, that we will be spending down reserves in the enterprise funds of $4,026,176. The special revenue funds will spend down $334,304 of, of capital and for operations. The debt service fund, that's the small fund again, will actually um, has a has a positive number of $39,077 because we receive um, assessment payments through the year and that will actually increase. The internal service funds will spend down $44,599, again, on for capital. And lastly, the trust and agency fund will spend $2,187,359. And that is uh, $1.6 million of that is a non-cash expense in the health insurance fund to recognize post-employment um, health care benefits that we pay as we go, but it's an accounting non-cash expense and the rest are uh, accumulation of small losses, small spending reserves that um, the other funds will incur. Again, for a total spend down of reserves of $7,063,950. The City of Castor's budget focuses on the general fund because the operations of that fund provide the general services to the community, relying on general revenue sources such as sales taxes, which is the most significant single source, and mineral taxes, both of which are state shared revenues. Also included in the general fund revenues are property taxes, franchise fees, as well as other taxes and charges for services. Preparation of the fiscal year 2017 proposed budget was do done during the beginning of an economic downturn, the extent of which is unknown. What is known is that, is that for fiscal year 2016, general sales taxes that fund general services again began declining in June of 2015. We started addressing the decline in June of 2015 by implementing a, um, a uh, hiring freeze just after that to start anticipate this downturn. The result of that sales tax downturn for 2016 is the total collections of sales taxes will be down approximately 30 percent. However, to, to note, and as you see in the sales tax charts, the last few months of the year since uh, February, the, the, uh, the deficit has been around a 40 percent, but it is leveled out, it appears. So we've not lost ground in the last several months, although the, the total number for those months is lower than the total for the year. The general fund expenditure budget proposed for the adoption of, for fiscal year 2017 is 13 percent, or $6.8 million less than the fiscal year 2016 estimated budget, and $10.9 million less than the fiscal 
fiscal year 16 adopted budget. And this includes approximately $540,000 of one-time cost for the voluntary retirement offer. And that uh, helps generate savings in the future years by reducing personnel costs. Um, as was the case for the hiring freeze implemented in fiscal year 16 for the and for the voluntary retirement offer, vacant positions in police, fire, and utility operations, frontline positions were or will be refil refilled um, in the foreseeable future to provide continued response times and service levels. Retaining as many possible frontline positions in all other operations will continue to be the focus. With efforts to reassign any management and supervisor responsibilities resulting from vacancies rather than refilling. The prominent feature of the 2017 budget is the establishment of a long term fiscal plan for the general fund. We were able to do that because of the reserves and general fund um, that's been made available. Unfortunately, approximately 17 years ago, the city council established a reserve fund reserve policy for the general fund that provided a prudent level of reserves for the boom and bust economy the city exists in. With those available reserves, the long-term financial plan identifies a glide path for the reduction of expenditures over approximately 10 years without making abrupt changes in services. That's not to say services, service changes won't be necessary, but they can be planned and communicated and anticipated and everything we can do the time, the time buys you to, to deal with those. Um, the city's comprehensive and multiple year multi-year capital improvement plan is continued in the fiscal year 2007 proposed budget um, again capital versus operating uh, capital is for those infrastructure asset expenditures where we maintain our buildings our underground infrastructure our paths our our, our parks our fields <coughs> and, and rolling stock and equipment Needed infrastructure construction projects and equipment purchases funded by optional one cent tax are budgeted in accordance to the citizen survey taken to guide the expenditures of that revenue source. This source of funding is critical for the community's infrastructure, capital facilities, and equipment. However, as with general sales tax revenue, optional one cent sales tax revenue has declined. Accordingly, the schedule of when projects and equipment purchases were to have been made for this funding from this funding has been adjusted to in order for expenditures not to exceed revenue. Local government cannot stop delivering services when economic conditions decline unless those declines are catastrophic. What a local government must do during a decline is prioritize service, prioritize service levels and adjust to available resources, which in itself is, a challenging, is, a, is challenging because the city is defined geographically and service levels may not necessarily be correlated to population. As demonstrated by the contents of the fiscal year 2017 proposed budget, city staff and I are keenly aware of the flexibility required in managing the city's resources for the delivery of services. The city will continue to have budget challenges in at least the next few years, if not beyond. Consequently, depending on month-to-month -month revenue and expenditure performances, I will make the necessary adjustments that are within my authority to address any continued decline in revenue and will seek city council action for those items under its purview. And I'll be glad to answer any questions. Questions? Councilman Hiley. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, city Manager McDonald, uh, in the <clears throat> last um, agenda item, we had a budget adjustments related to the voluntary uh, retirement program and in this we see spending of budget money for the voluntary retirement program could you clarify for me which fiscal year the spending for the voluntary retirement program is occurred Excuse me, your honor the spending the spending will occur June 30th in this year the um, the reference to next year is how it affects reserves and beginning reserves if I was unclear about that. Is that because of the continuing okay. health cares? Well, the, 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 reference, the reference to um, next year's changes is because next year is when the salary costs are freed up and it compares the difference between um, this year's 
personnel expenses and, and next year's personnel expenses. Excuse me, Mayor, I jumped ahead. And, and the health insurance question? Um, that, that's, that's helpful. Um, are, we, are we talking about 500000 to incentivize retirement? The number came out 540000 this year for the general fund and general fund dependent. Okay. The enterprise funds all pay for their sell, pay for their own, and some special revenue funds pay for their own. Okay. And the general fund doesn't carry the load for those. Thank you. Any more questions, Councilman Hopkins? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, I would uh, request that we ask VH to put uh, his explanation verbatim in the notes for the night, if that's appropriate for you. Sure. Yeah. That's good explanation. I appreciate it. Sure. Speaking of, should should we hand these to reporters? It's a it's the it's a document. We certainly okay. I would just state for the record, we mark it as exhibit number one and attach it uh, as part of the minutes. Thank okay. You. We are going to, do we need to vote on that? Public hearing. No. Okay. Okay. Exhibit number one, the budget consideration paper drafted by B.H. McDonald. Yeah. B.H., um, could you... Um, talk a little bit about the uh, number of employees that work for the city and where we are with our staffing now versus, uh, I don't know, just maybe at the beginning of the fiscal year. It's just currently ending so we can give, give people a sense of how we're trying to reduce personnel costs through these programs or through these actions. someone figures out how to have a smaller budget document, I'm all up for that. <laughs> a, lot of, a lot of information. Um, for fiscal year 17, um, we were authorized at 564 positions as a total. And for fiscal year 17, we're dropping that down to 200, or dropping that down to 540, 24 positions less. And that was our goal for our retirement. Was our goal for our retirement was about half of those are eligible, and 21 for the um, general fund. Some positions we're, we're carrying over and we're refilling, but we're making um, some pretty significant changes in staff. Thank you. Follow. Up. Yeah. Do either of those numbers include? positions that uh, by attrition are open but we chose not to uh, fill through the hiring freeze yes so the actual number of employees is less than the amount the number budgeted yes uh, follow up mr mayor yeah um, is there any reason for the citizens to be concerned that city services will uh, be negatively affected since we're trying to do the same amount of work for the same number of people with fewer employees? Are you satisfied that we'll be able to do our job with these reductions? For the next year, I am. It's a stretch for the for the employees, and we're working out. Uh, uh, we're working out more ways to um, better add value to work and stretch services as we, as we speak every week we work on things next week I th next year I think we'll be okay we are filling in with contract services in some places particularly internal service funds we'll fill in with some contract work we're looking at that for fleet we're looking at that for um, buildings those, those lend themselves to contract work um, buildings and janitorial repairs and things um, we are filling in with part-time staff. We have part-time budget for. I think we'll be, we, we can't continue to decline staff. We can't continue to cut staff because there's a point where you just can't provide the services. And that is a, that, that, is, that, is, a, that is a relationship with, st with, with uh, population. In some places, it's services directly related to population. Others, it's just related to geography. And we have to watch that carefully. Mr. Mayor. Yes. 
Thank you. And, and an additional follow-up, um, City Manager McDonald, would it be uh, fair to to regard the reduction in staff um, partly justified by the reduction in capital spending in that um, we have a, you know, a very significant reduction in capital spending and some of the staff supported capital spending projects? Possibly one or two positions in engineering. Not a, not a great deal. Not a lot. Okay. Any more questions? Oh, yeah, go just, ahead. Just, I think you already touched on this earlier, but um, this 37% figure, um, we had a large sum of money available to us that was unallocated through the 1 cent 14 process, and Mr. Rollins and others have pointed out that we have spent some of that money uh, on projects such as the Ogadon Lounge and the Plaza, et cetera. Um, this reduction, correct me if I'm wrong, but this, this, this reduction that looks as, as so large is, is, in, is in, in many respects reflects the fact that we had this un unallocated money that was subsequently allocated to projects, and we don't have that money anymore because the revenues have declined, and so it creates a, it, it reflects the boom and bust. Is that a fair statement? Your Honor, um, Councilman Powell, it does. It was a lot of capital activity, and when, like I said, when you when you get into capital activity, you almost double count that in a budget, and it's just one of the dilemmas with with multi funds as you. So, so it's much larger. As a rule of thumb, you can about cut it in half for the real outflow. Outflow that is slowed down, and those projects have been caught up. There's and there's also a lot of projects in the enterprise funds, um, uh, bail fill or land bail fill projects. So those 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 projects are wrapping up, and um, the projects mentioned earlier, Mike Cedar Pool, Hogan on. Um, Firehouse, fire station number six. Those projects were scheduled for years, encumbered, and then carried over, and those create some pretty hefty capital budgets, which won't be there shortly. One, I, one more, go ahead. Okay, go ahead. One more follow-up, excuse me. Um, and uh, VH, could you talk a little bit about our reserves and how you would see them helping us through this process because as many of us have come to the conclusion that we cannot assume that this downturn will be over anytime soon. Um, how long can we last given where we sit and how worried are you that we'll run out of money and not be able to cover these deficits? Your Honor, again, I'll focus on um, the general fund. The general fund has a reserve policy of approximately 50% of the um, funds expenses. The six months of operating with no revenue. Um, in, in, in 16, the year of the downturn, we will spend about four million of those reserves. We actually started the year off with more reserves than it planned because 15 was still a good year. And even though we had budgeted to spend down reserves on one-time capital, we still had reserves come in because revenues exceeded expenses. So we started the year in 15 better than we planned, or, or, or in 16 better than we planned. And um, that gave us a little extra. So we'll spend down $4 million this year. We're budgeted to spend down $9 million. Certainly if, the, certainly if the revenue changes a lot, that will change, and we've got to kick into another gear. That, was the, that is the current policy for reserves. Part of this budget is proposing the policy for reserves change to a more traditional reserve level of two months, about 16%. Um, Setting that as a baseline and our long-term fiscal plan, and if we continue to cut costs, and I don't know what form those costs will be in, right now our fiscal year plan just addresses personnel because that's the, that's, that's the one that is the biggest cost driver, so it's based on that. If we do that, we can run 10 years before we flatten out and, and, and glide into that two-month two reserve level. And it, it's kind of self, it, I don't want to say self-fulfilling, but it's kind of self-regulating. If we, if we continue this decline, you can't go down much more, so you don't have a bust to anticipate. So two months, the traditional two months of governmental reserves was, is okay. So we do have that benchmark to 
um, measure against. I think we can go several years unless things accelerate, and then we have to uh, we have to accelerate our changes. Councilman Hopkins. On the other hand, I reserve the right to ask to put more money away if things get better. <laughs> right. <laughs> Not necessarily in that account. But <laughs> so, in layman's terms, we're not putting money into the reserves while we're spending down the reserves. No. No. Got it. Sheesh. Councilman Checo. So, BH, so it's fair to say that we, we, the city, 17 years ago, prepared for this exact scenario. And that we are more, we are probably better prepared than any municipality in the state. Would that be a fair statement? I think we're well prepared for it. There are municipalities in the state that, um, um, Your Honor, carry pretty good reserve numbers in the 30 to 40 percent range that don't have the energy fluctuations that Casper has. And they could have other events happen in their local economy that would cause this. But we're, we're pretty well prepared. We looked at it 17 years ago, recommended the 50 percent policy. Council has funded it. We've relied on it a couple of times since then, in the 90s and in the, in the late 2000s with the real estate uh, um, bubble that came along that kind of affected Casper in a weird way. It was, a, it was short term, and then it bounced back. So we have relied on that a couple of times to not have to kick in a lot of cuts and, and adjust services. This is just another, you know, it's, it's, it's pretty much the walk the walk. If you're going to have reserves, you use them when things are down. Otherwise, why, why, why carry them? Thanks, BH. Okay. Are we ready to open this up to the public? At this time, I would ask those individuals who wish to speak in favor of the adoption of the fiscal year 2016-2017 budget to please approach the lectern. Speaking in favor of the 2016-2017... Keith, in favor. <laughs> Kidding. Welcome. He's good enough to moderate the speech. <laughs> 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 Three years as a citizen. Uh, citizen. And I just want to say that I'm in favor of a budget. So I thought this was all worth my time. Uh, my first comment has to do with the process by which we got to this point. And I was on the council for eight years, so I assume that the process was the same. And the process is the staff spends months and weeks putting together the numbers. Uh, the council spends two or three work sessions in the conference room listening to the staff present their numbers. Uh, the public can come and listen to a presentation but not comment because it's a work session. So I'm probably the first person to comment on the budget. <laughs> so the staff presents the budget, you list to them. I would venture to guess that the budget that you have before you tonight is probably 99% similar to what the staff proposed, because generally speaking, the staff is the one that makes an opening in the house and the council asks their questions of interest, so it generally goes along with what the staff said. And then the council votes on it. City Health Department, I would bring uh, 
very strict people, and they were asking for more money. I didn't get any more money, but I thought the chief of station pointed out how vulnerable a lot of these people are, so I was interested in what the city was going to do coming into the Constitution and putting this Constitution. And then the Community Action Partnership, which is more or less a clearinghouse for social service agencies and counties, makes the donation or allocation, the city makes an allocation. The county is cutting their budget substantially. Their contribution was provided to the 1% general fund. The general fund is down 10%, and the county's 1% allocation is down 30% through this community action partnership. So those are fairly big numbers, and then they, in turn, provide services to people who are on the edge, as a result of their homeless, and try to provide help for mentally ill people who need mentally ill. They funnel money to the Cal Health Center, and then they make sure they have access to those services. So I would just like to know, and then the one other budget question I had that I hoped I would get answered was, recently there was a comment from the Corey Hill about $5 million for the prevention project, and it was confusing where that came from, because I believe it was Corey today or yesterday that mentioned it was $1.5 million. And so I'd like to know exactly what the Corey Hill was talking about. Some general budget comments that I think you've kind of fallen short to here. I had to a situation by deciding to not accept bids from Edgewood Construction. At my last count, by awarding a bid to the second place bidder instead of the first place bidder, it was $880,000. And I don't know if there's another one I missed, but somewhere close to a million dollars. It cost the city an extra $1 million to take the second lowest bidder because of the policy not to award contracts to owners of the Edgewood. The $24 million in surplus or excess one-cent collections from this last cycle. Last I knew, the city had spent a little over $8 million for the $24 million. And I don't think there was really much discussion over the fact that the one-cent allocations going forward are going to be short because the collections are short. And so the amounts that you all allocated to the list of projects are likely short because now we're not collecting as much money. And as in the previous four-year cycles, the money that came in above the lowest anticipated, now it's likely the money that came in below the lowest anticipated. So how are you – that would have to be made up in some way or they'll have to cut back their budget. I also think that there's been comments made about, well, we can't spend one-cent money on operating budgets, which is not totally true because CATER has essentially funded in the past out of one-cent money. But it's also true a lot of sections of the city budget are a combination of one-cent and general operating funds or enterprise funds. So if there's money going into the water line, there's one-cent money going into the water line, there's other money going into the water line. So it seems to me it would be possible to put more one-cent money into the water line projects, for example, the creek project, and then pull out similar amounts for the general fund money and then use that general fund to things like city and county health care. So I think there's some comments in this discussion to say that one-cent money is not a good idea. The second sheet of ice, I think that was my mistake. I opposed that. And the yearly deficit from the event center used to run about $750,000. I saw in the information about the transfer to the private contract it's now up around a million. And I suspect that the increase in the deficit is partially due to having the second sheet of ice up there because the second sheet of ice never brought in the revenue suggested by our former city manager. And it's actually increased the deficit because they take down the boards and the nets and they pull the wood for the ice because the miner Louis Keen from the ice arena plays up there frequently. But they change out the setup frequently, not just a couple times a year. So that's a lot of cost when they do that. So I think that's actually a cost to that. 
on in the legal fee situation. I think he's made some mistakes. The interest cost because of that, which I think I was deposed in this lawsuit about two months ago, and you can tell what the different sides are. Two hundred and twenty bucks. Thanks. I didn't even notice. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> Questions or comments to address to keep citizen good enough? Thank you. I would ask individuals to speak in favor of the 2016-2017 budget to please approach the lectern. Speaking in favor. Okay. Anyone to speak in opposition to the 2016-2017 budget, please approach the lectern. Welcome, RC.
recreation goal is number three, which had been number six for us, depending on which year you looked at the budget. So for the average citizen to follow what is going on, it's kind of difficult if it doesn't have a parallel from one year to the other. So it's easy to follow and know where the funds are going and how they're being allocated and used. So it's just a readability type of thing, understanding that I'm just a representative of an average citizen, and I'm just trying to follow to see what's going on and how those funds uh, get uh, allotted. The one thing that really concerned me about this budget is the item on page 376. I am looking at the program last budget. And so when you're talking about family planning, it could very well be talking about surrogate plan, uh, plan, uh, parents. There are all kinds of things that can happen that help a person if they decide that they want to be a little man. That still is a health care concern, and it needs to be addressed. So I'm really concerned that the city of Casper is going to carry the burden of
questions or comments for R.C. Johnson? Your Honor. Yeah. I think just to clarify the council goals thing, um, we, I don't think we decided to put them in any particular order. That's just how they're listed, correct? It's not in order of importance. It just have, these are our three goals. And in 2014, we got together and took those seven or eight goals it was, I think, and then we just condensed them into three to make it a little easier, I guess. But it was never, you know, downtown's our number one goal. It's just how it, it was, it's just how it fell on, on the paper. It's not in, in order of importance or anything. So I can understand how it's confusing because we went from seven or eight goals to three and they switch orders. Um, well, actually, in your request for proposal on a comprehensive plan, it goes to 12. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's I, quite a big right. deal. Just help us understand when we decide to consolidate what has gone in. Do some crosswalks. Do the kinds of things that happen in other industries. Thank you. At this time, I would invite, yeah, go ahead. Point of order, Mr. Chair. Uh, from what I received, a text that Mike is not functioning for the uh, oh. citizen com comments. Okay. Um, can Technical problems, obviously. Can we just turn on that extra mic right there and call it good, or? Is that on? Yeah. No. Not working? I hear it. How about now? Nope. I can hear it. I think it is on. That's yeah, weird it is. Point. All right. <laughs> Thank you, citizen. Good enough. Okay. Anyone else to speak in opposition of the 2016-2017 budget? Anyone else to speak in opposition of the 2016-2017 budget? Please approach the lectern. I'm going to close the public hearing if nobody else starts forward. Okay. There being no others to speak for or against the adoption of the fiscal year budget 2016-2017, I now declare the public hearing closed. The chair would entertain a motion to, by resolution, authorize the adoption of the fiscal year 2016-2017 budget. So moved. Second. <laughs> Moved by Councilman Johnson, seconded by Councilman Hopkins. Discussion? Go ahead. I'll take a, yeah. a stab at a couple of council, former Councilman Goodenough's uh, questions. Um, I don't have this document committed to memory, but um, we are allocating money to the Children's Advocacy Project, the Community Action Partnership, and the Health Department. I believe we asked all of those agencies to accept a 10% cut, if I remember correctly. So they all are in the budget that are somewhat reduced, but I believe each was contacted and, uh, and was okay with that reduction, for, or at least understood the need for it. Is that a fair statement, Mr. McDonald? Your Honor, we we sent request, we sent a, a letter out to all the agencies we traditionally funded, and explained the revenue situation for them. We did not ask for a cut. However, some of them came forward with a 10% cut, and so we um, thought, out of fairness, we applied that to everyone. But we invited them to come back into council if they needed to have that funding restored or uh, actually increased. And I don't believe anyone responded to do that. I won't be able to cover all of these. I'm sure some of you, some of the other council members, can address some of these matters. Um, uh, don't, don't. I, I guess with respect to the second sheet of ice, um, you're absolutely correct that the revenues that we were hoping would come from that have not yet materialized. And uh, so, 
uh, and I, I'm sure that did have some role to play in that deficit increasing at the event center. A real problem at the event center is we're just having problems booking because we are trying to do it independently, and hopefully that will change with the outsourcing. Um, with respect to the conference center, um, we um, that that money, as I understand it, was held uh, aside after it was originally allocated for the um, Civic Auditorium many years ago. And um, when that project did not materialize, a portion of that money was kept in reserve, essentially, to work on a conference center, which um, at one point the city was looking at much larger investment in a conference center. Um, and um, what seems to be lost in this discussion is that um, with a, an agreement in place to assist with some of these infrastructure improvements, we are uh, holding a private developer accountable to spending four or five times the amount the city, at least the city, would uh, invest, and that that conference center may not materialize without those infrastructure improvements, and that that will have a very significant and long-term positive benefit to the community. Um, with request, since you brought up the Headquist bids again, we've discussed this ad nauseum, really, but um, I think uh, what's lost in those discussions is that we had um, good reason to take the second bidder based on performance difficulties, and um, the cheapest option isn't always the best option if projects don't get completed and, and significant amounts of staff time are required and legal fees paid in order to get projects done that should be should have been, should have been done on time. And um, with respect to the le other legal fees involving the Headquist matter, I guess I would just like to point out that anyone can sue anyone else at any time for any reason. And that's how our system works. And that's all I'll say about that. <laughs> so, uh, and, and, uh, and in respect, in, in response to um, uh, R.C. Johnson's uh, concerns, I guess I would also like to point out that we have elections, and when those elections take place, new people sit up here, and they may have a different view of the city's priorities and the city's needs than the previous council. And so it's quite understandable that a new group of people would come together and say, you know what, Th that was a good set of goals for that group of people, but I see it a little differently, and we're going to rewrite that. And we've seen that happen, and, a, and that's a healthy process. That's why we have elections, is so that new people can come in and have influence over uh, the, the course and direction of council. And uh, your question about the diversification, um, I, haven't, I haven't been here since, uh, well, 1911. <laughs> but I, I've only lived here for close to 30 years. And that entire 30 years, people have been talking about the need to diversify our economy. And, um, and I, I think some of the actions that we have engaged in have been taken on with that very thing in mind. And my belief is, and, and I don't know how many people in the room share this, but I believe that the key to diversification is to make this community a very attractive place for people to live with many uh, opportunities for, uh, with recreational opportunities, entertainment opportunities, with a street system and a water system that works, uh, where we have a reputation that if you come to Casper, you know, you've made a good choice. And so some of the things that we've been criticized for, you know, the plaza, of course, being the most prominent example, have that intent of trying to make this a more attractive community so that because if businesses can't get employees to come here, they're not going to want to locate here. And so uh, to me, it's, it's all part of the same problem, but um, uh, we're not going to diversify our economy by criticizing the energy industry, and we're not going to diverse our, diversify our, account, uh, our economy by uh, huge subsidies to businesses to coming in. We can't afford to do that. So I think what we have to do is concentrate on, on promoting our community and, can, and, and helping other people see what a wonderful place it is to live, and that the diversification will take care of itself to the extent that we do that. So that's my long speech. I'm going to just pop something in here. Um, referring to R.C. 
Johnson's concern about diversifying the economy, over there are two representatives from CADA, and that's their job. And Keith Goodenough criticizes the money we give to CADA from French franchise fees, tax and spend, I believe, was your characterization. But the role of CADA is to bring in businesses, and I think that that money spent, it falls whether or not you're an optimist or a pessimist, you know? Do, do, do we do nothing? Do we not advertise the amenities and try to bring business in? I don't know. I think that that hunkered down mentality in a downturn is, is as corrosive as the conditions themselves. Um, anyone else? Comments, questions? Go ahead. Um, one thing I did want to clarify a little bit, and Councilman Powell alluded to it, is that basically the money that it would be spent as uh, Citizen Good Enough alluded to for the convention center is basically that is public money on public streets, and that's for the improvements to D and E streets, and none of it is going on to private property or for private gain, so to speak. So that is public money to improve basically streets that need to be improved and to make that ease through and the congestion at Starbucks and some of the other places in that I-25 Center Street area, a uh, less congested, better area to get through. And all of those things are things that need to be done just to maintain the city. So I wanted to pass that on as well. Right, and, and for clarity, it was 5.5 .5 to the Civic Auditorium folks. Then that got moved to the Amico possibility and now it's been brought back and we're still talking about a fund of 5.1 and we haven't spent any of that yet. And the improvements that we're in entertaining discussion of to prettify the outside of private business building a convention center isn't going to be $5 million. It's going to be less. So that's... Those are important points of clarity. Um, while, while I'm clarifying, uh, Citizen Good Enough did misspeak in the fact that he said Councilman Hedquist. At no time was Councilman Hedquist, well, the minute Councilman Hedquist was no longer Councilman Hedquist we immediately started approving contracts from Hedquist Construction. Now I know that, you know, that's a that's a bone of contention, but he wasn't Councilman Hedquist when we started approving his construction. Okay. Um, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Just going back to the comments about diversification and strangely enough I think it goes back to probably when Miss Johnson's family was first in Casper Wyoming that was probably the first time that oil was discovered north of here in Midwest and it got refined here in Casper and the truth is I think ever since that time we've been looking for another golden bullet <laughs> or silver bullet if you will to diversify Casper's economy we keep trying we've got the Natrona County International Airport, which is an excellent asset. We're actually trying to, always trying to get businesses out there. We have got businesses out there. We have the largest airport in the state of Wyoming. Happens to be central to the state. Uh, we've also got, what's it called, the, uh, the zone. <laughs> international trade zone. Yeah, international trade zone. Yeah, the international trade zone. And uh, I think uh, we're working on that through CADA and the county to try and get that to cover the entire county. So that's just another feather in the cap of trying to diversify Casper's economy. We have seen Casper's economy diversify a little bit when it comes to tourism. We've got the Whitewater Park that brings a few people in. We've got 
things on the mountain that bring a few people in. And I think the, uh, well, the ski center up there will be doing more of that. So we're trying. But uh, if anybody knows of anybody that wants to build a business in Casper, send them our way or send them a bill. <laughs> Your Honor. Councilman Huff Humphrey. That doesn't matter. Um, I just want to dovetail into what you were saying about um, our formal councilman Hedquist because I think really it's about being a responsible bidder um, and completing contracts and when that doesn't occur somebody is deemed an irresponsible bidder um, regardless of whether they're not on council or not and frankly our council um, gave a second shot and I hope that it's going very well but it truly is about whether or not you complete your contracts and you're a responsible bidder and I think that was one of our biggest issues. Duly noted. Anyone else? Well, are we ready to move on to the question of amendments? Need a motion to adopt. Okay. Chair, we entertain a moment. Oh, we already have it. Johnson and Hawkins. Oh, okay. okay. Amendments? Please cast your vote. And please record the vote. With all members voting aye, motion passes. Okay, consideration of this next item will be by resolution. I now declare the public hearing open for the consideration of the appeal of the Planning and Zoning Commission's decision to deny a conditional use permit for an accessory building being a garage with 19 foot high walls in excess of the 12 foot maximum wall height permitted in an R2 one unit residential zoning district on lot eight block seven Pine View Meadows edition number two subdivision one located at 2850 East Fifth Street. City Attorney Lubin, do you have any exhibits? I do, Your Honor. I have uh, six main exhibits, uh, exhibit number five of which consists of five uh, sub-exhibits. Uh, all of these exhibits are as follows. Exhibit number one being correspondence from Liz Becker to V.H. McDonald dated June 13th, 2016. Exhibit number two, uh, that being the affidavit of publication as published in the Casper Star Tribune dated June 8th, 2016. Exhibit number three, uh, that document being a staff report from city staff to the Planning and Zoning Commission, which was dated May 13th, uh, 2016. <coughs> Pardon me. Exhibit number four, findings of fact and conclusions of law for case number PLN 016-024-C, uh, that document dated May 19th, 2016. Uh, exhibit number five. Uh, again, consists of five separate exhibits that were introduced at the May 19th, 2016 Planning and Zoning Commission meeting and consists of exhibits uh, lettered A through E. Exhibit A, conditional use permit application by the uh, applicant. Exhibit B, being the map of the 300-foot notification zone as required by ordinance. Exhibit C, the legal notice which was sent to the Casper Star Tribune advertising the date of the public hearing uh, in this matter. Uh, before the Planning and Zoning Commission. Exhibit D being the notice of public hearing sent to the property owners within the 300 foot radius of the subject property. And Exhibit E being a memo to the chairman and members of the Planning and Zoning Commission itself. And the final exhibit being exhibit number six and that document being the appeal request from John Cardenas to Craig Collins of the Casper, the Casper City Planner uh, for this appeal dated May 23rd, 2016. City Manager Report. Your Honor, Council is considering tonight a appeal from Mr. John Cardenas for a uh, conditional use permit um, that was applied for to be issued at uh, the address 2850 East 5th Street. And that was a permit that would authorize higher than, uh, uh, walls higher than the local, than the zoning for that area allow. Um, Planning and Zoning Commission considered that, did not find the, the requirements to allow that, and, and denied it. 
Uh, Mr. Condinas filed it within the appropriate number of days for council, and it is before you tonight to consider. Thank you. <clears throat> All right. At this time, I would ask those individuals who wish to speak in favor of issuing a conditional use permit to please approach the lectern. You may present any information, including information presented before the Planning and Zoning Commission. So if you want to speak in favor of the conditional use permit, which is going against the ruling of the Planning and Zoning Board, please approach the lectern. Hello. Um, could you pass it around or? Your Honor, I'd request that we mark this as exhibit number seven. And I will write on here exhibit number seven for identification. Request granted. And uh, I will pass it through council. Thank, Thank you. you. And I'd also ask this to be included as part of the record. Krista, did you get that? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, questions or comments to address to John Cardenas? Sure. Just so we're clear, from the text, I understand that you have agreed with the condition that the entire structure uh, will be cited, including the old concrete block yes. building. Okay, and that will match the house. Yes. Okay, thank you. Any more questions? Vice Mayor. If I recall correctly, too, the things that you just mentioned, the elimination of the window, the structural uh, investigation, and the siting were all amendments that were made to the original planning and zoning motion prior to their vote. Is that correct as well? Basically, when planning and zoning took their vote to either approve or deny, they had already made amendments to the conditions of approval that if they would have approved it, you would have had to have done the things you just mentioned. Uh, okay, let me let me take a whack at it. Um, this conditional use permit that you're asking for would include or not include the siding and the no windows and all of that. Craig, help me. Thank you. <laughs> Your Honor, I don't have a copy of the uh, resolution in front of me. The commission should be in the resolution okay. for approval. The, I believe the window uh, did not gain the number of votes uh, necessary to make that amendment. This is the right amendment that we have on the floor. Okay. Um, the siding was a uh, condition that was recommended by staff that actually the permit code that uh, makes the code requirements. 
Okay. Was the structural? So the window was brought up, but it was defeated as an amendment. That's all I remember. Okay. I, that's why I was asking. I... Any more questions or comments? Okay. Mr. Thank you. All right, anyone else to speak in favor of issuing a conditional use permit, please approach the lectern. You too may present any information. Thank you. Questions or comments for Nicole Briggs? And her address for the record, Your Honor. Oh, address for the record. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else to speak in favor of the conditional use permit, please approach the lectern. Anyone else speak in favor? Speaking in favor, going once. Speaking in favor. Okay. Anyone wishes to speak in opposition of issuing a conditional use permit, please approach the lectern. Speak in opposition. Welcome, sir. Name and address. Questions or comments for Ted Sellers? Thank you. Anyone else wish to speak in opposition of issuing a conditional use permit? Welcome, Mr. Steensland.
questions or comments for Dennis Steensland? Thank you. Anyone else to speak in opposition of the conditional use permit? Anyone else to speak in opposition? There being no more individuals to speak in opposition or in upholding the conditional use permit, I now declare the public hearing closed. Please read the resolution by title only. A resolution upholding the decision of the Casper Wyoming Planning and Zoning Commission denying a conditional use permit for an accessory building garage with 19 foot high walls in excess of the 12 foot maximum wall height permitted on lot 8 block 7 Pine View Meadows addition number 2 subdivision number 1 located at 2850 East 5th Street. Okay. Um. I just want to clarify, and this is for you, City Attorney Lubin. So a no vote opens the way for the conditional new conditional use permit, or a no vote upholds the planning and zoning. Uh, <clears throat> your first statement is correct. If council, let me restate that, if I may. Okay. If council votes down this resolution, that would open the door for council to consider the substitute resolution to approve the conditional use permit. In other words, if you vote in favor of the resolution that's before you now, you will uphold the Planning and Zoning Commission's decision to deny the conditional use permit. If council's desire through a majority is to allow the conditional use permit, then council needs to vote this resolution down. So a yes is to uphold the Planning and Zoning decision. That got correct. that? That is correct for this resolution that's before council. Okay. So we've already got our, our first and second, right? We haven't made a motion yet. Okay. Chair would entertain a motion to, by resolution, uphold the decision of the Planning and Zoning Commission in denying the conditional use permit. So moved. Second. Moved by Councilman Johnson, seconded by Councilman Humphrey. <clears throat> Discussion. Did we get it all done? Go ahead. Uh, a couple of comments. Uh, one, I noticed in his petition, he had indicated uh, one of the structures within the three block area was at 9, 921 Darrington. And obviously I didn't go take a tape measure to it. But if you look at the door size, compared with where the eave height is and that's what we're really talking about is the eave height and not necessarily the gabled end of a, of a building but if you look at that they were very unique in their design that it would appear that their wall height is not over the 12 feet because of the way they've got the barned roof on there right. so that it looks like they have tried to comply with that um, the other one, the 911 Darrington, um, I wasn't able to get by that one, um, and I don't know exactly what it all looks like. Uh, however, again, on the on the side that has the two dormers, that again appears to be not over the 12 foot height. Um, the back wall, I can't really tell where the where the gable falls yeah. uh, on that one. So. You know, it looks like potentially those two structures have actually met the current code. And when I drove past the gentleman's house and really looked at the area, uh, there are outside of, uh, there was a two-story house on the next corner over, I believe that's Fifth and Payne, but that's actually a, a house, not a detached structure. But otherwise, that was the only thing I noticed until you get several blocks away that was over a single story. So this is, a, in my opinion, starts to become a fairly significant change to the, the neighborhood. Okay. Oh, Councilman Hopkins. Well, I, I would just note that I think in PNC rules, R2 does not limit you to one story. 
So anybody in that neighborhood could build a second story on if they chose to. I too drove around there and there are several, several story structure, structures in the area. So it's, a, you know, it does, does meet the setbacks that were in place at that <coughs> time. And he's going to make it look similar to his house. And in my neighborhood, a little ways away from there, I guess, uh, we have, within a block, we have several structures like this in our block, plus several apartment complexes for that matter. But it, it really doesn't change the, the uh, outlook of the neighborhood. It, it's, it's part and parcel of it. And as a matter of fact, we, we have gone away from, at one point we said, if you ever had a mother-in-law apartment in your backyard, and this is not a mother-in-law apartment, uh, if it was not going to be rented, I think, for six months, it could never be rented again. We don't do that anymore because it makes sense to have people rent those apartments. So, and, and again, this is not an apartment. It's a garage addition is what it boils down to. <coughs> so, but, but there's no, just because several of the houses aren't two-story, it, it, R2 does not say it has to be one-story. <coughs> Okay. Thank you for that clarifier. Well, as the clarification, it actually only applies to detached <coughs> structures. Right, right. And that's where that's coming in as a detached structure. If it were all part of the single dwell building and dwelling, then, yeah, it could be 25 feet tall, i.e. a two-story. And that's what I was referring to as the one a block away is is a two-story all one unit not a detached councilman humphrey i guess i just have a general question to help me understand the history behind why 12 feet and what's our concern with 19 feet from a historical perspective does that make sense like, why not 19 feet and I hope that's not a dumb question. I'm sorry. Your Honor, it's not a dumb question. I'm not sure I have a good answer to this before I actually start my summary. Um, my understanding is uh, in Bull Creek, there was a very large building built, and uh, the accessory building uh, life limitation came as a result of a major outcry for that very large building that was um, out of place in that neighborhood. So I'm not sure why 12 feet. Go ahead. As long as you're at the podium, Greg, uh, uh, can you help us understand the um, conversation within the Planning and Zoning Commission? And were there objections about the windows and the siding, or were they pretty much focused on the height? Or was it just a matter of saying, why have rules if you're not going to follow them? While you're there, um, for all the libertarians saying, it's my property, leave me alone, let me do what I want, I'm investing in my property, why is that a bad thing? Explain to us why we should follow these rules and 
pay attention to zoning and codes. I know that was overly broad. Thanks. Although, I got to tell you, you were outdone in that argument at a leadership meeting when Councilman Powell said a zone is a promise to your neighbors. Okay, thank you. Mr. Mayor? Yes. Thank you. Um, I also toured the subject property or uh, from the street and from the alley and I want to compliment the owner for keeping a well-maintained property. I think, I think you're um, an exemplifier, responsible homeowner. Um, in the deliberations of this, I want council to also acknowledge that not only is this a zone with zone um, requirements, um, but that the conditional, the conditional use application is a process that is available for each citizen. For each citizen to be able to come up and say, I would like a conditional use, I would like an exemption from the zone. And uh, here again, the, the, the resident, the subject process has, has utilized uh, legal avenues in, in requesting his variance from the zone requirements. I think those are important because people get frustrated when you say there's an avenue for approval and and then you don't get that approval. That said, um, we entrust the Planning and Zoning Committee to uniformly um, uh, implement the rules, regulations, and processes, and uh, that too needs to be considered in tonight's vote. Very good. Councilman Powell. Your Honor, you did accurately quote me. I, I, we all struggle with these matters, and I have not been to the property, but I certainly accept what council, other, other council members report that this is a well-maintained property and that this um, request is made with the best of intentions. Um, for myself, though, I, I essentially agree with Mr. Steenfeld that if, if we're going to have a, a code, we should be following the code. And um, I think when people purchase a property, the code's in place, and um, we should all live within those guidelines. Um, I, I, it, it, it's even more troublesome that it's really not a line of sight issue because there are second story dwellings in the area. Um, but uh, I, I think uh, if you allow exceptions um, in, in this manner, and we have struggled with this in the past, uh, in essence, you water down the whole business of having a code that people can rely upon when they make their purchase decisions. And, and so, I think, uh, so I, I, I think I'm coming down on uh, denying the conditional use and supporting what the Planning and Zoning Commission said. I, too, am frustrated at times when you uh, don't have a full body there reviewing these matters. Um, but uh, I think what it, whether the code is a sensible code in this case or not, it is the code, and so I believe we should follow it. Thank you. Your Honor. Councilman Johnson. <clears throat> I understand the need for codes and, and, and that kind of a thing, but I think they're more there to protect the, the neighborhood from people building just something completely outrageous. Um, I think he's making this look like his house. The only problem is the walls are too high from what I see, and I really just don't see that as that big of an issue that we should deny this permit, so I'm going to be voting. Um, how are you supposed not to, to not uphold the Planning and Zoning <laughs> Commission in this instance and side with the homeowner? Councilman Pacheco. 
Uh, yeah, I, you know, I'm going to agree with Councilman Johnson on a couple fronts here. Uh, there's a reason we have this appeal process that comes, and we can take each one um, by um, case by case scenario. And that doesn't mean we just throw a rezoning law out, out the window for whatever it may be. And it doesn't. I don't feel it waters down the law. What I do think it does is it does uphold private property rights as well. And there is a fine line for us to, to balance that. With that being said, though, um, it's important for a homeowner to say, look, this is what I'm trying to do. And, and Councilman Johnson said, if it's not outrageous, if it's not without this, this whole idea that there's going to be a, um, a, um, you know, a, a disco up top, <laughs> yes, whatever it may be, um, I tend to side with, with that. And that may cause heartburn with P&Z in that sense, but there's a reason we have this, this process. And it's there to represent um, and also to um, represent uh, the, the citizens um, that pay taxes. And so um, uh, not to say that we would vote every single time on changing that and, and, and this process. But for me, um, if it's in with in a um, uh, very reasonable um, approach, then I would be willing to side with the private property owner. Um, uh, there's a level of where we have so many laws and regulations that we can sometimes have too much overreach. So that's, that's where I stand. Vice Mayor. Now that you heard my one side of the argument, I will throw out the other side of the argument <laughs> because actually P and Z voted three to two to approve it. Unfortunately, it requires a vote of four and there were two absent. So in reality, P and Z of the members there did approve the conditional use permit. So there's another aspect to be thinking about. So I thought I would throw that out there. So <laughs> welcome to our dilemma up here, folks. <laughs> right. Councilman Miller. Thank you, uh, Your Honor. And I'm just kind of looking at this. Number one, I, I, I believe the uh, P and Z probably would have passed this. And then, you know, I, right before I came here, I actually took a quick cruise throughout the neighborhood and tried to envision the structure as it's going in there. And the basis of my decision is it's not really going to change the neighborhood. You know, I think when this, this gets to our table, uh, you want to avoid the things that we were talking about with our zoning codes when you're driving through a neighborhood and you say, hey, what is that? You know, I don't think we have that here. We've got other structures of a similar size. It's not going to affect the integrity of the neighborhood. You know, um, that uh, I'm just saying I think we need to be uh, cautious of that, of, of that as well. <clears throat> okay, I would like a point of clarity, and this is for you, Mr. Cardenas. Are you not going to build that window that that overlooks and possibly intrudes in the? Okay. Got it. Okay. Thank you. Are, are we ready to vote now? Um, Just lost our machine. Do we have? <laughs> do we have any amendments to this? No. All right. Please cast your vote. And do you want to refresh our memory? Right. A, a yes vote upholds planning and zoning's denial. A no vote overturns it and starts us down the path of a conditional use permit. Oh. Oh, I got outvoted. <laughs> <laughs> With Councilman Powell voting aye, all others voting nay, <clears throat> motion fails. Okay. In light of the fact that the council has not upheld the Planning and Zoning Commission's decision in this matter, and having considered relevant factors required by Municipal Code Section 1712240H, the chair would entertain a motion to overturn the decision of the Planning and Zoning Commission and grant the conditional use permit as applied to find that one. Conditional use permit is consistent with the spirit, purpose, and intent of Title 17 of the Casper Municipal Code and will not substantially impair appropriate use of neighborhood property and will serve 
the public need, convenience, and welfare, and two, that the conditional use is designed to be compatible with adjacent land uses in the area of its locations. Please read the resolution by title only. The resolution reversing the decision of the Casper Wyoming Planning and Zoning Commission in denying a conditional use permit for an accessory building garage with a 19, high, with 19 high, foot high walls in excess of the 12 foot high maximum wall height permitted on light lot eight, block seven, Pineview Meadows edition number two, subdivision number one, located at 2850 East Fifth Street. Chair would entertain a motion to adopt a resolution just read. So moved. Seconded. Moved by Councilman Johnson, seconded by Councilman Miller. Discussion, amendments? Your Honor, if I may. Yes. Uh, a question was raised earlier, I believe, by uh, Councilman Caffey as to whether or not there was anything in the resolution regarding the windows. Right. Uh, if I could make a statement. Uh, the particular resolution as currently drafted states per section 1712-121-F, subsection F, subsection 6, for the Casper Municipal Code, the accessory, accessory building, once completed, shall be similar in exterior design with compatible exterior residential materials and roof pitch to the principal residential building and surrounding neighborhood residential structures. <clears throat> in addition, vertical, medical, vertical metal siding is expressly prohibited. However, there is no statement about the uh, windows on the west side. If council desires to uh, add that to this resolution, <clears throat> I would suggest an appropriate amendment uh, be made. But he's on board with the steel siding and compliant all except for the window. That is my understanding. Okay. I just wanted to point out to council, if a question existed about the windows, uh, it is not in the current resolution to grant the conditional use permit. So should we amend it to mention the windows? That is a question for you as your board. Mr. Mayor. Okay, go ahead. Uh, yes, I would like to propose an amendment, and actually it will be <clears throat> two things in one amendment. One of them would be to eliminate the west side window, and secondly would be to use the horizontal siding as is on his main residence. Because I think he mentioned he was going to go ahead and use the same steel siding, only his residence has horizontal, which looks like lap siding, as opposed to the vertical. Okay. Do we need to... I'll second that. Okay. Do we need to first vote on the amendment? Yes. yes. Okay. With the second. Okay. I have an amendment to, please refrain, to go oh. with, with vertical siding. Vertical steel siding and the elimination of the west window. Got it. Uh, okay. Excuse me. I believe he has horizontal siding. Horizontal siding. Horizontal. What did I say? Did I say, what did you say vertical? It's supposed to be horizontal. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> I believe the status of the motion is to clarify the resolution to provide that the uh, if the conditional use permit is granted, that it would be built with horizontal siding compatible with the siding on the residential structure with the elimination of any uh, windows on the west side of the structure as built. That's okay. And so that's the motion. It's, it was moved by Vice Mayor Caffey, seconded by Councilman Hopkins. So we're voting on that motion to include horizontal siding and the, emo, the elimination of the west window, windows. Got it? So we're voting on that right now. This is the amendment. So please cast your vote on that. With Councilmember uh, Council Member Pop Powell abstaining, all others voting <clears throat> aye, motion passes. Okay. So now we need to go back to the original. Your Honor, yes. Now you will be voting on the motion on the motion to approve the resolution as amended which was moved by Johnson, seconded by Hopkins, and now all we need to do is cast our vote on the conditional use permit. Discussion. Oh, do we need to discuss that? Do we need more discussion? Yeah. Yes, and, and I would, if, um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I would like to pose a question to uh, the city attorney. Mm -hmm. um, if this, um, if this action is is denied uh, and we do not grant the conditional use permit, 
um, does the applicant have an opportunity, a fair opportunity, to return to Planning and Zoning Committee and, and uh, get the full opinion of the full Planning and Zoning Committee in the future with um, perhaps an amended um, application similar to what we're discussing in this last amendment, et cetera? I, I would, uh, Your Honor, I would submit that the decision by the City Council uh, on this conditional use application is final and he could not resubmit an identical application uh, to planning and zoning, but he could submit an application if it was materially different. So for his appeal, were the appeal board and this decision is final on the application as it now stands. Got it. And a follow-up. Follow oh, first follow-up from Thank Pilot. you. Um, City Attorney Lubin, could you describe for me what uh, you would consider to be a materially different application? Uh, probably one that would bring the building within the uh, height requirement as an example with uh, or changes in the building somehow that would vary it from what the council, the Planning and Zoning Commission had before it. I'm not sure what those changes would be, whether it be extending the sidewalls or doing something different in that respect. But as a practical matter, the application, if he, he would not be able to bring the same application that he's brought upon appeal to the Planning and Zoning Commission. Councilman Hopkins. If I might, a couple of things. I don't know what he might propose for a, a different uh, change, but it could be considered by the uh, Planning and Zoning Commission, but it's unlikely that it would be uh, approved, at least with the three that were the vote that was there. Understood. The applicant did have the opportunity to postpone that uh, particular hearing uh, until more uh, Planning and Zoning Commissioners were present. Uh, my understanding is he opted not to do that. Uh, he took the risk then of the board that was there at that time. Uh, but there has to be finality to the proceedings. Okay. Well, a couple things. Uh, if you wanted to change it, what you, what you do is attach it to your house. <laughs> right. The breezeway. That's one way you could do it. But the other thing, he's got to start completely over, put in a new application fee. So he's got to start over, wait another month or two. So. For that reason, I mean, there's ways around it, and but right now I'm not sure it gains us anything to go there. Right. <coughs> okay. Are we ready to vote on granting a conditional use permit? Are we ready? Okay. Please cast your vote. Councilman Paul voting nay. All others voting aye. Motion passes. And, Your Honor, uh, we will bring forward a new resolution for your approval uh, reflecting the amendment as approved tonight. Thank you. And we'll just vote on that pro forma in the next regular meeting? No, it will be brought to you just for your signature because okay. uh, Council has passed the amendment. Okay. The form that's in your packet does not include that amendment. Right. So we need to uh, modify it to reflect the amendment so that the conditional use permit restrictions are are clear uh, in the document. So I need to read that before I sign it? Is that what you're saying? Probably should. Thank you. Whew. Okay. Do we need a break? Shall we press on? All right. I now declare the public hearing open for consideration of the transfer of ownership and location of retail liquor license number 15. City Attorney Lubin, do you have any exhibits? I do, Your Honor. Um, I have four exhibits for this item. Exhibit number one, correspondence from Tracy L. Belser to V.H. McDonald, dated June 10th, 2016. Exhibit number two, excuse me, <clears throat> that being the affidavit of publication as published in the Casper Star Tribune, dated June 3rd, 2016. Exhibit number three, uh, the affidavit of web website publication as published on the Casper uh, City website dated May 13th, 2016, and exhibit number four, that document being the actual liquor license application, which was filed with the city on May 9th, 2016. City Manager McDonald, do you have a report? Yes, I do, Your Honor. Uh, an application has been received for the transfer of ownership and location of retail liquor license number 15 from D&D Liquor. Liquors Incorporated doing business as Dorn's Fireside Lounge, and that's located at 1745 CY Avenue in the um, 
ownership and location is being transferred to OC Casper LLC, doing business as Old Chicago, and it's located at 3580 East 2nd Street. Currently, um, OC Casper or Old Chicago operates under the dual, the, the, the allowed dual licensing holding licenses of a uh, restaurant and a microbrewery. Those would be um, surrendered with the uh, transfer of this. And as the city attorney reported, the publications and uh, uh, print publications and web publications have all been made and the uh, application is in order. Thank you. All right. At this time, I would ask those individuals who wish to speak in favor of the transfer of retail, retail liquor license number 15 to please approach the lectern. Questions? I'm really glad that you mentioned that renovation because my question to you was, is this, is this really the license that you want? Because there's, there's stuff written into this full retail where you can't get cross-pollination with underage people and the restaurants and all that. And the, the way it seems to me to address those discrepancies with the Liquor Commission is to actually remodel the facility. Okay, and you understand all those, and, and we're not going to give you a, a problem by approving this transfer. I, no, I, don't, I do not believe so. Okay, all right. We operate, we operate full retail licenses at Fire Rock as well. Right. And so, um, and we're able to, you know, to, to be able to operate within those parameters. So I think that that's not too strong by the county of Santa Cruz. Okay. Any more questions or comments? All right, thank you. Anyone else to speak in favor of the transfer of retail liquor license number 15? Please approach the lectern.
Any questions for Mr. Dorn? I love your place. I, I've been there a few times. That's a, that's a cool place. <laughs> Thanks. Anyone else to speak in favor of transfer of retail liquor license number 15? Speaking in favor. Okay. Anyone to speak in opposition to the transfer of retail liquor license number 15? Please approach the lectern. Speaking in opposition. Okay. There being no others to speak for or against the transfer of retail liquor license number 15, I now declare the public hearing closed. The chair would entertain a motion to by minute action authorize the transfer of retail liquor license number 15. So moved. Moved by Vice Mayor Kathy, seconded by Councilman Hopkins. Discussion. Amendments. Please cast your vote. And please record the vote. With all members voting aye, motion passes. Council will now consider consent resolutions. Please read the consent resolutions by title only. Item 7A1. A resolution authorizing a contract for professional services with Nordic Sound Incorporated to install and configure video camera equipment in the city's council chambers. Item 7A2, a resolution authorizing an agreement with Ace Sandblasting and Coding Inc. for the primary clarifier number one recoding project. Item 7A3, a resolution <coughs> authorizing an agreement with Grizzly Excavating and Construction LLC for the city of Casper, Casper Family YMCA bid package number two. Item 7A4, a resolution authorizing an agreement with Grizzly Excavating and Construction LLC for the 2016 Miscellaneous Sanitary Sewer Replacements Project. Item 7A5, a resolution authorizing the lease of George Tanny Ballfield and Washington Park Ballfield to Casper Youth Baseball. Item 7A6, a resolution authorizing an agreement with SWI LLC for the Metro Animal Control Landscaping Project. Excuse me, Metro Animal Services Landscaping Project. Item 7A7, a resolution authorizing professional services contract with Casper Area Transportation Coalition, Inc., a Wyoming nonprofit corporation for fiscal year 2016-2017. Item 7A8, a resolution authorizing a contract with Computer Professionals Unlimited to purchase an in-car video server. Item 7A9, a resolution authorizing a contract with Coban Technologies, Inc., to purchase an in-car video server. Chair would entertain a motion to adopt the consent resolutions just read. So moved. Second. Moved by Councilman Johnson, seconded by Councilman Humphrey. Any abstentions or nay votes? Please cast your vote. And please record the vote. With all members voting aye, motion passes. Council will now consider minute action items. These are routine business items that do not require a resolution. Please read the consent minute action titles by, yeah, just read those action titles. Item 8A1, approving a letter of request from the mayor to ex for extension on a Wyoming Business Council grant. Item 8A2, authorizing the issuance of a taxi cab company license to Thomas Elliott doing business as Casper Cabs, located at 1147 East C Street. Item 8A3, authorizing the appointment of David Maxner to the Casper Housing Authority Board of Commissioners to complete a, the term of a vacated seat set to expire December 31st, 2018. Item 8A4, authorizing, an appointment, authorizing the appointment of new members Will Reese and Nicholas Grooms and the reappointment of Lisa Burridge to the Downtown Development Authority. Item 8A5, authorizing the purchase of two new triplex 5,000 pound forklifts from Wyoming Machinery Company for use by the Event Center section of the Leisure Services Department. Item 8A6, authorizing the purchase of one new Caterpillar 950M front end wheel loader from Wyoming Machinery Company for use by the Solid Waste Division of the Public Services Department. The chair would entertain a motion to approve the consent minute action agenda items just read. So moved. Moved by Councilman Pacheco, seconded by Councilman Miller. 
Any abstentions or nay votes? Please cast your votes. And please record the vote. With all members voting, aye. Motion passed. Now is the time we invite anyone in the audience to, who wishes to speak to council to come forward. We ask that you please state your name and address. Who wants to address council? Welcome, Mr. Giles. Woody Giles, 290 East Magnolia, Paradise Valley area. Um, two weeks ago, uh, we had a uh, the current 2016 land use plan meeting at the um, Wonder Bar, and uh, I was I attended, and it was kind of informative, but the format was not good to I guess meet all the tables or whatever. Happened, but anyway, uh, I did find some things, and I, I was I found it very interesting, and uh, so I went home and, uh, and I, I printed the 2000 uh, land use plan, and I'd like to go over it page by page. <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, I don't know. Have you all read it? It's um, it's it's quite the thing. Together, kind of well. Had a couple glitches that we dealt with uh, four years ago, but I don't. The, the 2016 plan is that something that you uh, are you did you pay for it in a lump sum or is it kind of a monthly kind of thing? How is that financed? Anybody care to answer that one? Thank you, Craig. Uh, Your Honor, we uh, set up the uh, the professional services contract to. Pay uh, when they meet certain milestones along the way. Um, so, uh, as, as they get through phase one and they uh, complete that successfully, we, we would cut them a check and then they'd be on to phase two and we'd make sure that they uh, met those milestones along the way. Okay. Okay. Um, because the, we have that, a that was a freebie, by the way. And because we have a budget crunch and whatnot, right. and, uh, I'd like to make the suggestion that you take the front page. Of Print 2016 on it and call it good because I mean, this it's a lot of wishful thinking and can't we all just get along and when you get done reading you want to kind of sing the national anthem or something but, <laughs> but you know it doesn't tell it doesn't cover the financing of how you want this done and there's some unrealistic thinking on some aspects but the new one's going to look just like this one and, and have the same stuff and um, so I, I just you know, stay with what you got it's, it's as good as it's going to get and you're going to save some money but one thing I did learn at that meeting at the Wonder Bar is I asked you know as I talked about the water tank on Country Club and when the city spends money, you actually, a lot of the time, actually produce a profit. I know this sounds crazy, but it, you can document it. And one example would be that water tank that was city and state money. And I, I asked how much a lot was going for down here in Gosfield Village, and was dumbfounded that because there's a realtor there at the meeting and he told me that a lot sells for seventy five to ninety thousand dollars a lot because you guys pay for a water tank. Well you didn't you took their money and built the tank and and if you do the math I, I sort of did a rough math but at twenty percent of the of the acreage used for roads and whatnot, um, that leaves, there's 107 acres and it's about five, uh, but you take away 20% and it's five lots to an acre. And it, I just used 80,000 of it. It's $34 million that <coughs> through your generosity, you made a few people wealthy. And 
you could recoup a little bit of that sort of, and you're not going to recoup it from the guy who benefits. You're going to get it from the person who paid $80,000 from him, not from the guy who, who got the money, you know what I mean? He didn't take the money and run. So you made a gift to, to a few individuals, and I, I think we can do better. And, and we're still vetting uh, this guy, I don't know, that's going to come up here and tell you how to diversify your economy, improve all kinds of different conditions, and, you know, just, just do what you want done, and that won't cost the money that you're spending now to not get it done, and accomplish a lot of things in here, and still not cost you a whole lot, just recoup some of that money that you made and gave to him. Ready for the questions that won't come? <laughs> questions or comments for Woody Giles? Just kind of a comment. Yeah. Woody, it's, it's perhaps a little different. I was, I was just looking at one of the contracts that we signed for some miscellaneous work on sewers and so forth. <coughs> Urban Gutter is quoted in this quote as $22 a linear foot. <coughs> so if you've got Curb and Gutter down both sides of the streets and you've got uh, asphalt, at, uh, let's see, what, what's asphalt at? Going per ton, $670 a ton. That's, I don't know, call it 100 square feet for ducks. So these guys do have to put some money in. Absolutely. And in fact, they do have to make their money back. <laughs> the fact remains, if these people who aren't here didn't cough up the money to pay for this tank, they'd be getting nothing. So, so we wouldn't have any houses to live in. I'm all for houses, <laughs> don't get me wrong, but I don't think we have to like enrich a few kind of, you know what I mean? Yeah. $4,000, this guy will come and tell you how to do it. And when you go to the store and you buy stuff, that's not a tax. You are getting something for your money. Is that correct? Yep. So I think that, that property owners, if you had a hundred thousand dollar property, and the city did something to make it worth two hundred thousand, and you were to cough up fifty grand, you're still fifty thousand to the good. You follow me here? No. So you you wouldn't have some. Oh, I got to pay fifty thousand. You know, you'd still be benefiting. So, but some people benefit more than others. Then we ought to regulate profit. No, no. Not only be six percent no, profit ought to no, be it. No, I'm a free enterprise of capitalism. It's the only way to be. I'm not a socialist. I'm not a communist. I'm, you know, but there's a better, I, I way. There's a better way. So, anything else? Any more questions? Thank you. I wrote your quote down, Woody. Some people benefit more than others. <laughs> Dennis. <laughs> I didn't come prepared for this. I just wanted to commend Carter Powell and the people that bring up issues in the in the, in the back rows here. Uh, tonight was a very interesting meeting. Everybody participated, which I haven't seen in a lot of meetings. There's, there's meetings when there's council members that don't say a word. That always makes me wonder. Uh, we know they're getting paid. <laughs> so anyway, tonight was the exception. Darwin brought up, I, I thought he addressed uh, these good enough issues. Uh, I like the fact that he brings up those issues. Uh, I think they're pertinent. I think he does his, his research. Uh, I just thought it was an exceptional meeting with one exception. Uh -oh. Charlie, I can never hear you because your mic is way off the oh, corner. Dang it, and, uh, yeah, one time admitting to bad hearing, but uh, I'm not uh, not accepting that anymore because I hear everybody else. I'll try to do better. Thank you. you no, you do you do great. Anyway, just a commendation that, that tonight's meeting was exceptional. Thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, Councilman Humphrey. Sometimes I'm quiet, so I stay out of trouble. <laughs> I was advised that by other council members. You're going through some tough times. Don't press her too hard because I did, a, did anticipate in giving you a phone call. 
<laughs> I, I really doubt that. <laughs> Anyone else? Oh, city manager. If I may, Your Honor, at a point, I'd like to clarify something. Okay. Um, let's see if anybody else is in the gallery that wants to address council. Anyone else want to address council? Okay. City manager, what do you have to um, clarify? Your Honor, I'd like to go back to the uh, item that uh, um, Councilman Hiley so correctly pointed out, and that's the the, the confusing sentence that the 540,000 one-time costs uh, was included in the budget. It was included in the, it's included in the base numbers that the budget's compared to, and I will go back and correct my report as it's put into the, to the minutes to clarify that. So thank you for pointing that out. Thank you. It's a, it's a, it's a confusing statement that could be clear. Okay. And when I, when we prepare those minutes, that'll be changed. That will be corrected to be a clearer okay. representation. Okay. Thank you. All right. Let's uh, go around the table, starting with Councilman Powell. Uh, nothing this evening. Uh, I do want to compliment uh, City Manager McDonald, Cassie, the rest of the financial office for all of the work they did on presenting the budget. I think it's a responsible budget that it is based on reality, and uh, it's not a pretty reality, but it is what it is. And I think uh, I think we're going to be okay. Councilman Hopkins. Just a couple items. Uh, I think you guys had in your handouts tonight uh, a progress report, progress report, excuse me, on West Yellowstone. You can see the progress that's being made out there. <coughs> and actually, one of the things that people probably don't realize is uh, every meeting down, or every every week in the OYD, there's a meeting that's held to let everybody in the OYD know what's transpired this week. And that's uh, been hosted uh, by Paul and his wife at the paint store down there. And of course, he was one of the original guys working on the OYD team and our mayor at one point. So just wanted you guys to know that. And then the other thing, uh, just, I guess, my hat's off to Chief King for taking on the Respect Our River campaign. Uh, it was responsible for saving a life last Friday. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So. Good. Councilman Miller. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, I, too, uh, just the uh, uh, Mayor Councilman uh, Powell's things about the city being able to prepare us a good document on where we are with the budget. Having gone through this the first time, it was, it, it, it's, it's a lot of information but it's very simply organized, if that's a good way to put it. So it, it, it kind of makes our decisions easier when we have documents that kind of make sense and go with how the information is presented to us. So I do want to give, uh, 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 I guess, a pat on the back to um, City Manager McDonald and the rest of the city staff who had anything to do with the budget because um, when, when I came into those meetings, I thought it was going to be pretty rough. You know, you hear but a four-hour budgeting meeting, and you don't think you're going to have a very good time. But I, I felt like it, it was, they were well-run meetings, and we had good information. And that's thanks to, uh, to our staff. Uh, the only other thing I have is uh, last week, uh, I, a number of us participated in on some of the CNFR activities. And um, again, being fairly newer to the community, I haven't really done much with that. But I do have to say that that's a real gem in our community that to have that event here and you know that's kind of one where I look back and say hey way to go Casper for us being able to have that there and I, I was sitting eating dinner after the rodeo on Thursday night and talked to a number of different people this wasn't their first time to come do this you know they they come to CNFR every year they come stay in our hotels eat at the restaurants um, and I think we that's a really neat thing and when we talk about economic diversification yeah that's one small part of it but we got to keep supporting those types of activities. And I just want to thank also Councilman Cathy for the work he put in on the, the um, I don't, what is it called, the board or the commission that, that puts that on. It, 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 and I was really happy to be invited to, to see what we do there and what, how that impacts our city. Um, and that's all. Thank you. Councilman Hump Humphrey. It, it's hard to get used to. I yeah, don't okay. know how to sign my name. Um, 
You know, I'm, I apologize. I missed a couple of meetings, one for a little medical procedure and um, a little late returning back from vacation. So I don't have a report, and I apologize for texting. One of my residents just passed away, so mm -hmm. it's going to be an adventurous night. But um, I'll get up to speed and ready to go. So, But I did learn that I love zip lining. So if any of you go, I want to come with you. It's a hoot. Zip lining. <laughs> Councilman Pacheco. Uh, again, just wanted to reiterate um, <clears throat> my uh, gratitude to uh, uh, VH and, and his staff and um, Cass and all the work that they put into it. And, and I know it's easy um, uh, to look on the outside and, and make um, uh, these ideas that take place and things like that and not know exactly with everything that's the work and things that are done and, and so it's very vital and I appreciate what um, Dennis said is and it is this was a good meeting and our meetings are good this this is a great group of people to work with and part of that is is that the communication and though, though we have our lively discussions and we disagree we still walk out of here and we still respect each other and that's that's part of public discourse um, and we can disagree and being able to do that and, and I think remaining positive in how we do these things and that this downturn isn't the end of the world, um, that we are going to move forward. We're going to continue to do that stuff with the foresight that we have. And I think that kind of vision and, and leadership is needed. And um, I think we need to remain positive um, but also be pragmatic. And we also need to be um, very cognizant of being fiscally responsible. Um, it's very important that we do that. But um, uh, I'm proud to sit here at the seat and work with these um, councilmen and and um, the work that you guys do. And so thank you, VH, for your hard work on, on the budget. And we're moving in the right direction. So thank you. Councilman Hiley. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, a couple of comments coming out of tonight's meeting. And first of all, on economic diversity, uh, maybe the city doesn't get enough credit for what it's done. Uh, I, I've been up here and said it before, but this is a totally different town than the town I moved into 19 years ago. And it's a better place to live because of what the people who've sat up here before have done. Um, and you know, while it's sad to see, like with the liquor license transfer, um, that you know we'll be losing one um, good local business, but an, you know another local business is growing, and and that's good. Uh, we have a lot of new diversity in this in this community, and it's it's going to continue to be a strength for us as uh, we go through the energy uh, industry hard times. For the city employees, uh, I want to thank you for for your patience during this budget process. Um, you know, we've had somebody stand up and say we should cut their pay by 5%. Uh, in reality, we have. Uh, in the last uh, year, we, we've not approved a second half of the cost of living adjustments. And this year, we've also not approved a cost of living adjustment. My hope is that the economy is going to give us an opportunity to reward the employees who work so hard for the city. Uh, with a cost of living adjustment, preferably before the end of the year, but uh, I don't I don't agree with the suggestion that the city employees, for their efforts, deserve to have their pay cut, and that's not something that I'm going to stand by. Um, buses, same thing. Um, you know what? Uh, once again, uh, this, this group has has just looked at uh, bus routes and, and plans for changes, and, and those changes in the bus routes are being implemented so that the buses are operated with greater efficiency in the city. And during hard times, the needs for public transportation is greater, not lesser. You don't cut things you need during hard times. I can't abide by that suggestion. I just want to say that. And finally, um, uh, to the to the members of the Planning and Zoning Commission, um, they're not paid for what they do. They volunteer a lot of time, and, and I thank them for their work. And, and I know that tonight we uh, overruled one of their decisions, and, and and that doesn't mean that I think they're doing poor work. It just means that, I, you know, in consideration of all things, 
that we heard this evening, we had a different opinion. That's it. Thank you. Councilman Johnson. I brought this up in the pre-meeting, but I, I had a, um, and for a while I've had this, this concern about the intersection on the new uh, bypass on Robertson Road and, and how dangerous it is, and it's, and it's proven itself to be dangerous with a fatal accident we had a couple of days ago, and, um, you know, this wasn't the first major accident with injury in that intersection. Um, and so, unfortunately, this, this intersection is outside of the city purview. Um, it's a state highway and a county road uh, intersection, so I think we decided that maybe a letter from this council to the state would be appropriate um, so that maybe they could be pressured to make some changes to make that intersection a little safer. Um, I'm not the only one I've, uh, that shares that concern. I've been contacted by um, constituents out on the west side of town uh, about the same issue, so hopefully we can get that done and, and make that a safer uh, intersection. Um, other than that, I have a meeting with the um, Convention and Visitors Bureau next week, and that's all I have. Vice Mayor Kathy. Uh, I would also like to reiterate comments by all of the other council members about what a great job uh, the city manager and his staff have done on the budget. And I would also reiterate that this is a good plan to wade slowly into the water rather than jumping into the deep end as has been proposed by some of the people. Um, I don't feel that it's our <clears throat> purview at this time to start closing down the amenities. The, the good things that we have here, we have a lot of good people here. Um, the city manager mentioned that we will be monitoring as we go along the revenues that have come in, which is basically what we've done for the last for the last year, um, and actually it even started before that. Uh, we actually put the hiring freeze in in April before of April of 2015 before the FY16 budget even came into effect. So we have been monitoring this for the last 14 months now and we're on a reasonable path, and we owe a, a debt of gratitude to the city manager and the city staff for coming up with the numbers, for coming up with some of the plans, and to be able to, to maintain services for the public and, and not have to do the drastic pay cuts. Uh, nobody here's grocery bills went down. Nobody's car insurance went down. Nobody's gasoline prices went down. And so we just need to try to help support the community, the city employees, and the businesses within town. And as was brought up, we had a very good attendance at the CNFR. Rev uh, attendance was down this year, which um, that, was, that was expected, but um, it was a very good rodeo. A lot of young people were here. A lot of great young people were here, and the people that come here enjoy being in Casper, and they spread the good word about Casper to the rest of the country. We had people here from Tennessee, from Mississippi, from Alabama, Louisiana, Texas, Oklahoma, Kansas, um, and it goes on all the way to the West Coast. Uh, I just can't even name them all, but they come here because they like it here, they want to come here, this is the height of, of their sport. And it's a good thing for Casper. And um, enough about the rodeo. We had a very good Joint Powers Water Board meeting today. Um, plans are proceeding there for the new water tank out by the airport. Uh, that will be continuing on. So hopefully that will help out uh, as well for some of the economic development uh, better water in, in places out around the airport. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Um, I also would like to give kudos to Cassia and to B.H. McDonald and who's that other staff that worked hard on this? Kurt? Kurt Gunderson. Okay. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I would, would very much like to publicly acknowledge that work. It's enormously complex and it is 
it's real work. It's real work. And we appreciate the level of refinement that we get because if you didn't if you didn't do all that work, then we would be lost. So that is very much appreciated. Um, I also attended the CNFR government nights, waved my hat to the crowd. Um, just so you know, the dinner on Monday night, I wore a 1925 stitz, and it was cool, and about this big. Um, also, <laughs> also attended the uh, regional water board meeting today, and um, things are well in hand. Dave Hill retired. Dave Hill retired. He's he's the water guru, and um, he's retired. So hopefully he won't leave town. Should we have any questions that can only be answered by. 20 plus years of institutional memory. So um, that was good. Anything else? Any, I'm trying to think of any constituent concerns. I made notes, but I lost them. Okay, well, we'll just have to bring that up later. Oh, I thought of one. Um, Mosquito Spring is county, so quit calling the city if you want the fog truck to come because that's county. Other than that, I don't I don't know why the county has 0% going to the health department. We'll need to figure that one out. But other than that, um, county does a good job too and we're all under budget constraints. So the next meetings of city council will be a work session to be held at 4.30 p.m. Tuesday, June 28th, 2016 in the council meeting room and the uh, regular session council meeting will be held at 6 p.m. Tuesday, July 5th in the council chambers. Chair would entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Moved by Councilman Johnson, seconded by Councilman Miller. Please cast your vote. And please record with, your phone. with Councilman Hiley voting nay. Motion passes. Until next week, actually. He has to stay until the next meeting adjourns.